students we had a discussion on how to examine oral cavity how to examine jaw in earlier sessions in detail it's related to the same topic little different that is examination of paranasal sinuses examination of the pharynx examination of nasal cavity examination of the larynx it is more complicated even though you have learnt these things in ent as a general surgeon you have to know because many times neck lymph node will come then primary may be in these areas you can't say i have learnt and finished now i can't recollect i can't remember so you should have as a clinician you should have a basic idea how to how to examine these things and i am going to discuss relevant topics whatever it comes uh, under these may not be in detail because detail you have learnt earlier but at least basic you should have a idea as a general surgery student as a general surgery clinician we should have idea this is what i am going to discuss uh, today we should have a backup of uh, earlier sessions of examination of oral cavity and jaw it is probably a continuation of those things to have a complete picture of head and neck region in toto as a clinical approach so at the end of the session students will be able to learn the following examinations of pharynx larynx nasal cavities paranasal sinuses nasopharyngeal carcinoma this is very important uh, malignancy often difficult to detect rather very aggressive so you need to know something about it which you have learnt it is just a recapitulation as a general surgeon general surgical student maxillary tumors again you have learnt carcinoma larynx again you have learnt so i'll just highlight it in the exam theory question may not be asked or little bit they will ask why wa mcqs why wa they will ask and mainly clinical side when you when you get head and neck uh, swelling head and neck cases oral ulcer oral malignancy neck swelling then they will definitely ask uh, what is the uh, how to examine larynx uh, how to examine paranasal sinuses how to examine uh, nostril now we can't say i don't know i have learnt in ent my that session is over uh, now i can't recollect once you have learnt you have to know so everything you won't be able to recollect so what is to be known in the in the current uh, surgical uh, setup surgical examination that basic thing you have to know so it is just a recollection of what you have learnt in ent i am just doing it what is relevant as far as general surgeon is concerned not everything whatever ent people have taught so examination of pharynx pharynx has got three parts just it is all this recollection which you have learnt nasopharynx oropharynx laryngopharynx nasal pharynx is post nasal space otherwise called as epipharynx it is the uppermost part of pharynx situated behind the nose and above the lower part of soft palate so soft palate you have seen hard palate soft palate extension extension of the hard palate soft palate it is a non bony it is there is no bone in that soft the mobile also it has got muscles are there so many muscles are there in the soft palate um, so anteriorly it communicates with the nasal cavities inferiorly with the oropharynx through nasopharyngeal isthmus It's called the Poisson's ridge between the oropharynx and nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx. Pharynx is divided into three. So lateral wall contains opening of the auditory tube, tubal elevation, fossa of rosa mulla, pharyngeal recess behind the tubal elevation. So this is important because when you do posterior rhinoscopy, you will be able to see all these things where site of a primary tumor may be there in the tubal elevation, uh, fossa of rosa mulla. One of the occult, uh, one of the second is in the neck with the occult primary site is location. unknown primary not occult primary unknown primary site location is uh, uh, fossa of rosen muller so they will be able to see should it is in the lesser pharynx so we should be able to have the idea about tubal elevation tube this is uh, above the upper edge of the superior constrictor eustachian tube opens into the anterior lateral wall of this one fossa of rosen muller is located very very important thing in surgical side to remember located above and behind the opening of the eustachian tube as a small depression what is that above above and behind from the ear eustachian tube comes and joins the nasopharynx there is a connection above and behind there is a recess that is called fossa of rosen muller very important area small primary may be there in this area uh, malignancy and that may cause secondness in the neck that is a unknown primary location actually fossa of rosen muller roof continues the posterior wall of the pharynx adjacent to base of occiput adjacent to base of occiput nasopharynx contains lymphoid aggregates called pharyngeal tonsil which is small and absent or absent in adult but well there for children and pathologically can be enlarged as adenoids adenoids actually adenoids i said waldier ring posteriorly adenoids adenoids is a pathological name colloquially we consider it as a uh, clinical uh, name they call it as adenoids but actually it is a pharyngeal tonsil 
Veringal tonsil, tubal tonsil, palatine tonsil, lingual tonsil. So normally it is called as a pharyngeal tonsil. Pathologically in children we call it as it's usually via enlarged in children, adult it is not there, it is atrophied. In children it is called as adenoids when it is enlarged. So otherwise normally it is called as pharyngeal tonsil. Pharyngeal tonsil, tubal tonsil, pharyngeal tonsil is above behind, tubal tonsil, uh, palatine tonsil, so what you call the tonsil, the palatine tonsil, lingual tonsil here midline, same thing, tubal tonsil, palatine tonsil, what and lingual tonsil. So, so this is the anterior, this is the posterior, pharyngeal posterior, pharyngeal tonsil is otherwise called as uh, adenoids in children when it is enlarged. Normal and anatomical name is pharyngeal tonsil, adenoid is it when it is enlarged. Tubal tonsil is a collection of lymphoid tissue one on each side behind the tubal opening, near adjacent to the tube, estrogen tube. Then palatine tonsil, tonsil itself, lingual tonsil is behind in the posterior of the tongue. The order, this is called Waldir ring actually. I earlier discussed it, Waldir ring. So, examination of nasopharynx, how to do that? Nasopharynx palpated when the patient sitting on a stool, examiner stands behind the patient with the patient extending his neck and head which is supported by examiner's body. We support the patient that is very very important. After opening the mouth, one side index finger is pushed, pushes the cheek inward from outside to prevent biting the examiner's hand because the gag reflex will be there. So reflexly he, oh, he will do like that. So bite it like that, he won't do, they won't bite your finger and it will be comfortable so that you can your index finger go behind and feel the nasopharynx. Index finger of the other hand pass it inside behind the soft palate towards the nasopharynx to see for the roof for adenoids and wall of the nasopharynx. For nasopharyngeal carcinoma you will be able to feel like that. Even though technically it is difficult but it is a methodology which you have to know how to do that from behind uh, put your finger like this. I will show the photo then you will understand. So that is how exactly you will do it. Posterior pharyngeal wall is palpated for retropharyngeal abscess which is felt and only often seen after proper depression of the tongue can be seen when inspected using a direct laryngoscopy of course. It is felt in an indentable cushion like projection to the finger. Retropharyngeal abscess I have discussed in a first chapter topic chapter 1 swelling uh, and eventually in the neck and uh, it is uh, uh, in the midline it is uh, chronic retropharyngeal abscess usually due to tuberculosis uh, of the cervical vertebra. Uh, and whereas in the paramedian it is a separation of the uh, pharyngeal lymph nodes, retropharyngeal lymph node, it is a paramedian, it is acute, it forms a tender uh, separative of soft swelling and uh, present as acute inflammation and it is usually drained acute, acute paramedian uh, retropharyngeal abscess drained perorally whereas uh, midline chronic retropharyngeal abscess usually to have tuberculosis origin drained it because sieves laterally towards the posterior tank of the neck so it is usually drained. Uh, through the neck. So, there is a difference you have to remember chronic and acute retropharyngeal abscess. Acute is lateral, paramedian, and chronic is a midline, uh, median, behind the prevertebral fascia due to tuberculosis. So, so, that I have discussed with the photo diagram, everything when I have discussed in the uh, chapter 1 swelling in that to different topics. We can go through those sessions when, if, when you when, if you want to recapitulate the thing, whatever you want. Acute retropharyngeal abscess usually due to retropharyngeal lymph node separation occupied okay, the lateral position already told. Chronic retropharyngeal abscess is usually due to tuberculosis of cervical spine and behind the prevertebral patient is situated in the midline. However, occasionally tuberculosis retropharyngeal lymph nodes can occur as a rare entity in such a situation which will be in lateral position. It also may present as swelling, cold abscess in the neck, behind the synovial mustard muscle. Back of the tongue is palpated for growth. Again, when you do this method, back of the tongue also should be palpated, there may growth there. So, what are the diseases of the phary uh, pharynx? Tonsillitis. Pharyngitis, I am not discussing these things, it is a very common day to day uh, condition which usually seen by clinician, physician, ENT surgeon, sometimes general surgeon, all can treat um, this one, uh, this condition. Peritonsillar abscess is very important, collection of pus between the tonsillar capsule and the lateral pharyngeal wall following an attack of acute tonsillitis. Once acute, acute tonsillitis occurs, it may resolve with the antibiotic, it may resolve on its own, it may go for a recurrent episode of tonsillitis or it may form a peritonsillar abscess and in the uh, between the tonsil and the lateral pharyngeal wall which needs drainage usually under anesthesia you make an incision and drain it carcinoma tonsil rare seen in old age and unilateral presents with the severe pain in the throat referred to ear due to infiltration of gastropharyngeal nerve dysphagia fetal oris bleeding and enlarged lymph nodes are the features 
so lymph nodes get, local lymph nodes get enlarged bleeding is comes very aggressive carcinoma tonsil is not that simple malignancy it's quite aggressive uh, malignancy i think in earlier session i have shown the different photos of the carcinoma to, uh, pharynx uh, pha- carcinoma tons- tonsil i also shown the photo of uh, tonsillitis both tonsil enlargement and it uh, narrows the oropharynx opening difficult swallowing occurs in children all those things i have shown in earlier sessions so you have to always uh, look for the pharynx also uh, tonsil also in this patient non esophageal carcinoma is one of the thing just i want to discuss with you people because it is uh, difficult to uh, clinically diagnose initial phases but very very important because it's very very aggressive uh, malignancy often very difficult to manage so it is a common in china taiwan hong kong mongolia it's seen in india also not that common but it's seen we have seen few patient definitely ent people regularly see such patient in india it is common in northeast region it is commonly squamous cell carcinoma most of the time sometimes can be adenocarcinoma lymphoma minor salivary gland sarcoma other malignancy like and that can occur rarely in that nasa pharynx lymphoma can occur minor salivary gland sarcoma adenocarcinoma can occur but mainly it is squamous cell carcinoma 85% that's what we are worried in other way nasa pharyngeal carcinoma means we consider it as squamous cell carcinoma other malignancy can occur in the nasa pharynx or lymphoma minor cell gland tumor sarcoma other carcinoma is adenocarcinoma of course it can be proliferative ulcerative infiltrative lymphoepithelium or nasa pharynx is called as spinke rogo tumor it is a very aggressive tumor lymphoepithelium is a very specific entity uh, which occurs in nasa pharynx it also occurs in the tonsil and it is called as spinke rogo tumor it is very aggressive tumor it got a pure uh, 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 prognosis because it lymphatic uh, component as well as uh, epithelial component squamous cell carcinoma with the lympho- lymph- lymphatic component so very very aggressive malignancy with very poor prognosis it's called as spinke rogo tumor common site of uh, is force of Ros- where is the common site of nasopharyngeal carcinoma is the force of rosenmuller i already told it is related to the uh, histogen tube above and behind there is a recess the site were very difficult to uh, recognize clinically and, uh, and silently causes a uh, second disease in the neck until then it not recognized it is a problem it is three times common in males it may be treated with the little the ftin bar virus it is only see that ftin bar virus causes infection in mononucleosis and also it is many many malignancies can be presented with the ftin bar virus it's very important uh, to remember so host triangle in the supraclavicular fossa is very important uh, because the site where Uh, second disc can occur surface marking boundaries by medial and lateral ends of the clavicle and point where neck meets the shoulder it is a site where metastatic node commonly exists exists in mesopharyngeal carcinoma this is called host triangle host triangle hos host triangle uh, between the clavicle homohyoid and uh, homoclavicular triangle it is it is also called a supraclavicular subclavian or homoclavicular triangle is bounded by clavicle below oblique part of the homohyoid muscle above with the base medially or the posterior uh, border of the sternocardium mustard muscle so this is the sternocardium this is the sternocardium mustard muscle like this this is the midline this is the clavicle like this this is the omohyoid this is the host triangle host triangle so base is base base is the sternocardium mustard muscle posterior border here so upper border is omohyoid muscle with uh, another border is clavicle clavicle wherever it comes like this so this is the host triangle where the lymph node is commonly enlarged in this triangle this is the lymph node so this is a where metastatic lymph node begins actually starts actually occurs here in this region here here in this region remember so that is a host triangle remember in 50 is mcq may be asked uh, in uh, sometimes it is you all already these things i, I presume you are you are you are learned in ent you understood it 50% is nodal involvement is bilateral because it can it can be bilateral because often cervical lymphopathy may be the first presentation that's what is primary is very difficult to identify it will quiet also it won't present with any features rather they present with the secondaries the metastatic present with the metastatic disease there is a problem with the uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma clinical features may be nasal autogenic ophthalmo neurogenic involving most of the canal nerves with facial pain squint diplopia exophthalmos ophthalmoplegia jugular foramina syndrome all these nerves are getting because invariably it invariably it goes to the base of the skull because very close there in the nasopharynx above 
so naturally all those neurocanal nerves of that side will get involved uh, 9th 10th uh, 11th nodal spread distant spread to distant spread can occur in systemic spread can occur even that is a carcinoma i said oral carcinoma usually loco regional local plus lymphatic spread lojan lymph node uncommon unless uh, there is immunosuppression or hiv the metastatic disease in the lung where this is this this is frequent question but not so it is got a very it anyway causes a lot of problem by involving the bed of bed of skull or, and uh, causing all these problems i have to, already told and it can spread to the bones lungs and liver this is something that can occur that is why we differ from the traditional oral carcinomas unilateral serous osteitis media may be the only presentation it may cause there and they present the otitis media so they keep on going to the ent surgeon and get some treatment or sometimes only clinician or on their own they will take some treatment so that is that is how be, be, until they get evaluated when become severe then only they come to know that there is some problem so features are epistaxis nasal speech post nasal discharge and nasal obstruction so all these things will be there if you carefully ask the history pain in the ear unilateral deafness due to compression of the stethoscope tube with the fluid collection in the middle ear you know that common site is behind in the fossa of rosen muller or adjacent to the stethoscope tube naturally to compress the tumor when it enlarges compress the stethoscope tube so naturally fluid collection occurs so they have deafness elevation and immobility of the soft palate of the same side because of the cranial nerve involvement soft palate you know movement will not be there same side immobility occurs so carefully if you examine the palate then you will be able to understand that pain in the area of distribution of the trigeminal nerve due to direct infiltration of the nerve at the foramen or lacerum so because all these things are very close in the base of the skull so infiltrate trigeminal nerve cranial nerve and that uh, causes the pain in the distribution of that the neurologic pain they will have so sometimes they say think the zoster infection or some infective pathology all those things until eventually we think that it's a some uh, aggressive advanced malignancy causing all this problem and then you evaluate this patient by proper imaging with the ct reconstruction imaging then you will see involvement of bed of skull nasal pharynx lymph nodes everything and when you realize that is uh, it's a malignancy by the time it is fairly advanced and very aggressive tumor whatever you do therapy which eventually carries poor prognosis palpable secondary in the upper deep cervical lymph nodes so that is very common i said i said host triangle i said boundary uh, posterior third of the uh, posterior border of the uh, trochoidomas tied omohyoid clavicle it is called ho apostrophe as host triangle where the first lymph node usually known so we got very aggressive tumor is a triad which often asked in mcq in viva they will ask theory they may be especially they will ask unilateral deafness i said which is in tube get blocked immobile elevated soft palate cranial nerve involvement pain in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve again because of the cranial nerve involvement trigeminal nerve involvement so this is a very triad important triad process the triad very bad probably pathognomonic of the nasopharyngeal as if you carefully elicit history you will be able to identify this one. but first presentation is the neck node and uh, then you get all these features then you see the nasopharyngeal carcinoma but by then it is fairly advanced and further uh, evaluate this patient by imaging entire body pet ct ct abdomen ct chest then you will understand that already spread to the lungs bone liver fairly beyond your hands to cure the disease so what are the differential diagnosis lymphoma lymphoepithelioma minor cellular gland tumors all these things can occur in this area biopsy at the primary site by proper uh, video endoscopy there and nasopharyngoscopy there posterior endoscopy you can see you can do and uh, identify it fnh of the neck lymph nodes very important x ray of the skull to visualize erosions but it's a little old thing the dynamic ct scan skull base of base uh, base of the skull then uh, neck uh, pharynx area everything in all to do a reconstruct to image image with the dynamic this one will be able to see everything not just ct scan dynamic ct scan this is the most important it's ideal with the reconstruction image all these things you have to do a reconstruct to image to get a proper uh, assessment of this uh, or uh, tumor there so treatment is external radiation for primary rt is the main modality of treatment because it's very very inaccessible for surgical approach in so far as especially this area so you won't be able to do any surgery give a radiotherapy for the primary is a radio sensitive of course neck you have to do a radical dissection anywhere in the anywhere in the body remember lymph nodes are better amenable for surgery when it is operable of course after that if not surgery is not possible advanced stage or locally lymph nodes are not amenable for that because it fixed posterior then you give radio therapy chemo radio therapy then if it becomes a anywhere i am telling in general if it becomes mobile 
uh, becomes operable, then you can do and go and do the radical neck dissection in this uh, in such patients. So, mobile lymph node, give a RT to the primary radiotherapy, then uh, do a radical neck dissection. So, anywhere, especially in the oral cavity or overfairing, so head and neck cancers, plan primary treatment separately, plan secondary treatment separately. It's as an independent entity, even though it's a single disease. Primary, if it's amenable for surgery, do a wide local excision, then decompression, depending on the flap requirement, maybe uh, micro flaps uh, or local flaps or depending on the or uh, flaps from the pedicle flap from the petrol spinal PMF flap or whatever it is and treat secondary separately uh, modify radical neck dissection but case like this a very aggressive tumor do a radical neck dissection remove everything at least give some hope to have a survival provided there are no metastatic disease N2 A, N2 B, N2 C contralateral neck dissection is needed spinal because of many times bilateral involvement spinal accessory is never preserved while doing block dissection in esophageal carcinoma. That's what I said. It is not preserved. So always do a radical neck dissection RND. Usually MRND is MRND is not done. This is done. RND done. MRND not done in esophageal carcinoma. This is what you would remember. It's a very aggressive tumor, so there's no preservation. Otherwise, by and large, in oral malignancy or other conditions, currently, at least we preserve final accessory nerve. Even though, if you want to remove stenocardial mustard muscle and uh, IJV, you dissect uh, uh, and retain the final accessory nerve. That is the usual uh, approach. And sometimes, in a very less aggressive malignancy, is well differentiated. Then you do a MR and you retain everything: IJV, stenocardial mustard muscle, and final accessory nerve. Do a block dissection. But it is not so, you remove IJV, you remove final accessory nerve also in this patient, in esophageal carcinoma. This is what you have to remember. So, RND is an indication here, not MRND. That is what I want to express. Treatment primary is radiotherapy, treatment secondary is surgery. Then, of course, add on to chemotherapy, whatever is suitable. But again, prognosis is poor. Remember trotter stack. Remember where exactly it is located. Remember host angle. Remember it is very, very, very aggressive malignancy. Chemotherapy, of course, mean, without drugs, they have they are used, they are used, I said, there are so many chemotherapy, newer chemotherapy uh, regimes are uh, available, uh, available, uh, depending on the oncologist uh, uh, decisions, whatever that individual they will decide, depending on the aggressiveness, uh, all those things they will decide. Different further chemotherapy regimes are available, so many drugs are available, depending on that you decide. Skull based surgeries are useful here. Remember, I said skull based is not so here, especially skull based surgeons, you have to call them in case if you want to do a aggressive uh, radical resection of everything. So, nasopharynx is over, now oropharynx. Nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, like that it is. So, oropharynx below the level of short palate, already I have discussed above with nasopharynx. So, it's the middle part of the pharynx which communicates above to the nasopharynx through nasopharyngeal isthmus in front of the oral cavity through oropharyngeal isthmus below to the laryngopharynx at the level of the upper border of the epiglottis. So, from the upper border of the epiglottis, from the level of the uh, uh, level of the soft palate. Above the soft palate, nasopharynx. Soft palate to the epiglottis, oropharynx. Below the epiglottis, laryngopharynx. Like that, its pharynx is divided into upper, middle and lower. Palatine tonsil lies in the tonsillar fossa in the lateral wall, one on each side between the palatopharyngeal arches by the palatopharyngeal muscle behind palatoglossus arch in front, tonsils are seen per se. Per, per orally. Even though I have discussed in the nasopharynx, in under nasopharynx tonsils, tonsils are basically in the oropharynx, but during visualization, tonsils will be able to see. I have discussed all those because pharyngeal tonsils are there, comes under that. So, so I discussed that uh, as I, when adenoids are come there. But uh, it basically palatine tonsils are in the tonsil, what we call traditionally. They are in the actually oropharynx. It has got arches uh, anterior and behind. Uh, palatoglossus muscle and palatopharyngeus muscle are formed. Anterior pillar is formed by the palatoglossus, uh, uh, posterior pillar by the palatopharyngeus muscle. Oropharynx is formed by, uh, formed behind by superior, middle, posterior constrictor of the pharynx. So, superior constrictor covers like this, inferior constrictor covers like this. It hugs superior constrictor, in, middle constrictor, inferior constrictor, like a tube hugging, like this. Superior constrictor, inferior constrictor, middle constrictor comes like this. One after other, like a uh, hugging, it is like a Multiple bottles you keep, no, like that it it comes like that. So examination of oropharynx inspection it is done under proper illumination either with a torch or head mirror. 
head is studied by the nurse from behind and mouth is widely opened oropharynx is examined using two spatulas spatulas are very very important at least two spatulas you should use tongue is depressed with one spatula and with another with the, and with another cheek is retracted laterally and with the tip gently compressing the anterior pillar of the fossis tonsillar crypts size the surface the discharge the surrounding area should be examined in adult tonsils are atrophied and small especially in uh, children and young adults or adolescents uh, tonsils are big and enlarged of course you have to look for in every age group you have to look for tubercles you have to look for ulcer you have to look for swelling uh, that may be malignant it may be pathological so all those things you have to remember even though in adult atrophy disease can occur so that you have to remember always but in children tonsils are often enlarged so much that both sides touch uh, in the midline this is called kissing tonsils both sides touch in midline tubercles in the tonsils may be obvious in peritonsillar abscess soft palate is grossly inflamed ulla edematous swollen and pushed to opposite side any ulceration growth the swelling retropharyngeal abscess granulation um, uh, pharyngitis discharge over posterior wall is observed palpation anterior pillar of tonsil is pressed with the spatula type and quality of discharge is noted cc white discharge is not of significance whereas in septic tonsil it pus in, in is seen coming out of the crypts ear pain halitosis blood stained saliva hemorrhage ulceration fungation dysphagia trismus palpable significant neck lymph nodes all features of carcinoma tonsils so we have to remember carcinoma that is what i meant they will have halitosis they will have ear pain refer to the uh, ear saliva blood stained saliva hemorrhage ulceration fungation dysphagia because when there is tonsil enlarged it to malignancy it causes a difficulty in swallowing and uh, it may cause trismus by involving the muscle in the deeper plane uh, or maybe due to spasm neck lymph node palpable is quite common especially due to digastric lymphosarcoma develops in the tonsil young individual painless swelling in the throat thick speech large pale tonsil are the initial features of lymphosarcoma of tonsil extra capsular spread may cause palpable and often visible swelling behind and below the angle of mandible as a direct extension of primary tumor this is what you have to remember secondary scan occur and you know that tonsil it will deeper play in uh, one side in carotid vessels will be there other side it comes to pharyngeal wall and from the pharyngeal wall if you need to infiltrate and may primary tumor can present as a mass here other than next secondary spread so that is also possible a visible primary tumor extending into the neck outside the across the pharynx that can occur that's what it meant exactly so you have to look for all these things whatever the feature but sooner cervical lymph node get enlarged in, in same place as secondary and become palpable and lymph nodes also get may primary and this one may fuse together also so examination of the nasal cavities and paranasal air sinuses now uh, uh, i am starting this one because it is head and neck is comes as n block laryngopharynx uh, i larynx i will discuss a little later so because everything this part head, head and neck region will be covered together this way i am discussing this part first and then we'll go for the larynx little later so nasal cavity inspection is very very important which you have learnt in uh, ent earlier just a recapitulation i am doing inspection outer surface of the nose is observed for any swelling or ulcer any deformity due to deviated nasal septum or depressed nasal bridge is noted in the rhinophyma tip of the nose is enlarged i have discussed this one in a swelling chapter where i have shown the photo you can recapitulate that lupus vulgaris there may be ulceration distortion of the nose lnsi are observed for its movements with with which collapse on inspiration when there is nasal obstruction by lifting the tip of the nose the vestibule inferior terminate anterior part of the septum is observed any nasal polyp is present is observed anterior rhinoscopy it is done with the help of thudicum speculum under bright light the speculum is held with the left hand and inserted into the nasal cavity the blades closed it is gently opened to dilate the nostril structures that are observed are anterior part of the nasal septum anterior part of inferior and middle terminates with their corresponding meters anterior part of the floor of the nose entire thing floor side wall roof septum everything should be visualized of course dilate it properly and another thing is proper illumination that's what is required when you uh, inspect uh, nasal cavity mucous membrane cartilage septum turbinates middle and inferior all those things should be examined presence of polyp ulcers bleeding points swelling bulge should be looked for very clearly nasal secretion should be observed so this is such a small area so many things are there so your observation and inspection is so important remember middle meter is observed for any pus suggesting suggestive of suppuration in the maxillary frontal anterior ethmoidal sinuses 
pus between middle turbinate and septum surgery suppuration of the posterior group of epidermal sinuses so wherever that meatus whatever the type meatus pus discharge the corresponding sinus is a problem and so it will correlate depending on the where exactly it comes out so which all these things you have learnt in ent i'm just telling the tenderness surrounding sinuses should be palpated so palpating surrounding sinus also important so so next is posterior you know what is anterior rhinoscopy so i'm just showing the posterior rhinoscopy uh, patient is asked to open the mouth posterior pharynx is anesthetized by spraying lignocaine tongue is depressed with spatula post nasal mirror is inserted after the prior warming into the mouth and placed between the ulna and posterior pharyngeal wall light is focused over the mirror structures that are observed are posterior end of nasal septum is seen as a white pillar posterior nares posterior aspect superior middle and inferior turbinates posterior aspect of superior middle meatai adenoid over the upper posterior wall the nasal pharynx adenoid already told in children it is seen it otherwise called as a pharyngeal tonsil in the posterior aspect is a part of the wall deer ring which i have discussed so many times earlier just to recapitulate and opening of the stitch in tube also you have to see any ulcer growth entrocorneal polyp is present is observed so that is about the posterior rhinoscopy very very important examination of the uh, uh, this part uh, of nasopharynx as well as nasal part both any pus secretion relation turbinates is observed there is a nasopharynx tongue rhinoscope posterior rhinoscopy so this is of the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses i am not going to discuss that fracture nasal bone hematoma nasal septum septal deviation foreign body nose rhinosporidiosis it is a uh, rhinosporidiosis seberi is an infection that causes uh, polypoidosis one and four will be there so proper excision is very very important common site is nose other areas it can occur so that is you have discussed in uh, ent so i am not going to discuss that sinusitis very common cause of headache frontal maxillary frontal ethmoid model important don't and so what is what is worried is the present a sinusitis headache it may be tumor within that is very business to rule out by properly imaging it so what is what tumor maxillary sinus tumor or other sinus tumors so this is what we are interested always because it present with the next second is it may present with the bulge in the oral cavity it may present with bulge in the uh, bulge in the nasal cavity or it may cause a orbital or uh, Uh, pro- uh, protrusion. So the, all the things it suffer in the area it may, may cause may present a swelling in the outside in the uh, maxilla face. So all those things are the different presentations, uh, which as a clinician you should know uh, basic concepts of uh, assessing this patient. So exam the parental sinuses. What is the important test? Transfusion test for maxilla sinus. I have discussed in this one. While I was when when I was discussing about the oral cavity examination in earlier session. Uh, it is carried out in a dark room a torch is inserted in the mouth of the patient and pressed against the middle of the heart palate and patient is asked to close the mouth normally cherry red glow is seen on either side of the face with a crescentic fold of infraorbital margin now normally maxillary sinus is a transfusionent uh, but when there is infection pus is there maxillary sinusitis pus is there it won't be, won't be transfusionent and in tumor also it won't be transfusionent So you would either put a torch, eliminate a new torch inside the mouth, then close by this, then see whether it happens or not. In a dark room, you have to do that. Otherwise, you can from outside apply a torch here and see and compare opposite side. And you have to do always in a dark room, pen light, uh, maybe a place rest on the left, the inferior portion of the each orbit and glow may be observed through the palate. Patient dentures must be removed. That's very if there is external denture, it should be removed always while doing that. Transfusion test for frontal sinus also you can do that. Torch is placed against the inner corner of the orbit. Here inside that you can always do that. So there is a transfusion test for maxilla. See that from outside, from inside also you can do that. So transfusion results may be reported as opaque, dull, or normal. So in different conditions it may be opaque. A unilaterally opaque maxilla sinus is always abnormal. So opacity is always pathological. Remember. absence of infraorbital crescent absence of glow through the lower fornix of conjunctiva absence of transmission of light through the cheek all indicate negative transfusion often seen maxillary sinus where there is pus in the sinus with the swollen mucous membrane or growth in the maxillary sinus so growth pus glowing will be not be there elimination of the con- lower conjunctiva will not be there so that is a typical thing uh, or infraorbital crescent will not be there so that says that there is a negative there is negative transfusion and there is some pathology Now, phalasis in the test occur due to variation in the bone thickness, asymmetry of development of sinus. That is the natural phalasis of the sinus. 
postural test it helps in find out the def definitive source of pus when present in the middle meters patient sits upright and the pus is wiped out decongestive drug is applied patient sits and middle meters you check actually if pus appears immediately then it comes from the frontal sinus if it comes after some period of time it is from the ethmoidal sinus if pus comes only when the head is bent forward the suspected side becomes it is a, it is a maxillary sinus so postural test is important to find out which sinus is involved whether it is frontal sinus whether it is uh, ethmoidal sinus or whether it is maxillary sinus so where it is comes so accordingly you have to plan the treatment so very important uh, clinical test you have to remember you have to differentiate whatever the which sinus is involved uh, whether it is frontal whether it is ethmoid whether it is maxillary differentiate between the, these three sinuses now lymph nodes can get enlarged and maybe infect you or maybe uh, uh, malignancy malignancy again level 1 2 submandibular and upper deep cervical lymph nodes are involved so that means one and two these are the commonly involved neck lymph nodes so once you once you had idea about uh, paranasal sinus uh, nasopharynx oropharynx of course i said laryngopharynx i'll discuss a little later because we finish of the block of the head and neck then come to the larynx here it is larger lower especially it comes around the neck actually uh, in the deeper pain that's why i said that part we'll discuss a little later so maxillary tumors we'll discuss uh, because this is the one which as a surgeon we are also worried at least have a clinical diagnosis eventually of course ENT people, recurrent surgeon, skull base surgeons, all these people get involved to plan the treatment. Uh, oncologist, onco surgeon, and so on. Whoever it is, it's a rather a team work of managing maxillary sinus tumor. Not that difficult, not that easy actually, and uh, requires a proper planning. So you should have, as a clinician, you should have idea to diagnose these things and have a, a clear idea about how to approach these patients uh, as a knowledge. Uh, so we'll just discuss about that. Maxillary sinus is a common site of malignancy of paranasal sinuses. So, common sinus involves maxillary sinus, ethmoid, frontal, sphenoid, and the next order. It is common in people working in furniture industries, mustard gas industries, and leather industries. It is common in bantus in South Africa, where snuff with nickel and chromium commonly used. Now, types are very common. It is common cell carcinoma. Remember, it can occur adenocarcinoma. Occasionally, transverse cell carcinoma occur. Cellular gland tumor occur. Sarcoma, melanoma, Burkitt's lymphoma. Burkitt's lymphoma occurs in the lower jaw. It can occur in the maxillary, maxillary also. Remember, so all these things are common. What we are commonly concerned with is squamous cell carcinoma. Same thing like nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma is the commonest thing. See that carcinoma maxillary sinus. Look at that young boy. It's a young boy. He's around 15, 18, 16 year old. And see that maxillary sinus tumor. It's bulgy here. See the tumor coming out of the palate. Rather advanced. Of course, you have to visualize the orbital margin. You have to see whether there is a bulge of the orbit. Also, see the another patient because it is gone into the orbital margin. See the eye here. You can't open the eye, and it come out here actually. If you open mouth, you can see that it come out. It's advanced. It's quite advanced. See the maxilla so much. Compare here. See that. See this side and this side. You compare. See that nose. It is come out of nose here. Here also observe nose because everything you have to observe. You have to examine nostril. You have to examine this because it's bulgy here. It's coming out. It's coming out here. See that inside it, the tumor. You can see it is normal here. It is bulging out into the orbit, and here it is coming out of the palate. You can see the palate here. It is coming out in the palate. So outside also is come out here also into the all all walls are involved. It is rather advanced. So everything is involved here. See that everything is involved here. All walls are involved. Rather local advanced. Of course, neck, I mean, neck lymph node may be examined. May be there. Maybe lung lung pneumonia or lung spread also maybe there in this patient. So neck also should be examined. It's a local local areas. Look at that palate, no nostril, outside cheek, orbit. All walls are involved. Very very typical maxillary tumor it is. So presentation initially may be symptomless or may present with epistaxis or features of chronic sinusitis. When it spreads, that's what you remember. You think every chronic sinusitis need not be inflammatory. It may be malignant. So you, it is the clinician's business to rule out uh, whether it is malignant or not, because priority should be given in identifying maxillary tumor very early uh, before it spreads locally and regionally and eventually cause a lot of problem in managing and you lead to the poor outcome if it is so. When it spreads to the floor, loosening of the teeth, necrosis, anteroral fistula can occur. It come into the floor, then anteroral fistula occur through the alveolus it comes. Through the palate it comes, through the nostril it goes, through the orbit it goes. So oral cavity it may cause anteroral fistula, 
एक्सटेंशन मीडियल एक होता नेजल ब्लॉक फंगेशन नेजल डिस्चार्ज ब्लॉकेज ऑफ नेजल एक्ट्रोमल डक्ट इन एपी फोर अ कैन ऑफ कर वाटर ट्रिकलिंग ऑफ द वाटर बिकॉज नेजल एक्ट्रोमल डक्ट इज ब्लॉक एट मीडियली सो मीडियली बिलो एब लैटरल आउटवर्ड दिस वॉट टिपिकल एट एंड पोस्टीरियर इन टू द बेज ऑफ स्कल लिख द थ्री डायमेंशन लाइक दैट सो ब्लैक ए बॉक्स इट इज ऑल ओवर सो वेरी टिपिकल सो अकॉर्डिंगली इट प्रसेंट विद वट एवर फीचर्स एक्सटेंशन एंटीरियरली कॉज पेन एनस्टेसिया एंड स्वेलिंग इन द चीक Ulceration, fungation in the skin later. Swelling we have seen, nasal area we have seen, orbital involvement we have seen, palate involvement we have seen. Every area we have seen the fit. That photo, if you remember, everything is very clear how they present with. Spread above into the orbit causes epiphora, diplopia, protosia. Already told. Posterior spread is most dangerous. It is not revealed easily. That's what I said. Posteriorly, we go to the base of the skull. You won't be knowing at all. It causes post nasal discharge, pain, trismus, limitation of temporal mandibular joint. It may extend into the TM joint and may develop trismus. Involvement of upper deep cervical nodes in later stage is common. So lymph node involvement, posterior, outward, medially, below, above, everything. Look at look, look at this like a box it is. So we can have a very clear idea. So look at recall, examine all these uh, regions of this in relation to the. Uh, maglary sinus that's what is very very important and accordingly i'll say that is accordingly examine then find the finally you can have the uh, clear cut uh, local idea idea at the local extension of the disease of course differential in the chronic sinus it is very very important you treat thinking that is chronic sinus and that is a criminal you think you can suspect malignancy always rule out is very very important because pick up this patient very early that's the most important thing you have to you have to consider and get as a clinician So classification, I'm just putting on grounds classification. So first structure level, the major level, the middle can test. This is the line, on grounds line, O H N G R N, on grounds line. So above structural, below it is infrastructural, below the line. It is classified to plan the treatment. Actually, there are so many other classifications. I'm not detailing it because you have learned these things in the ENT. The gross idea I want to put. Lederman classification: two horizontal lines are used. One passes through the floor of the orbit, another passes through the floor of the antra. See that. Floor of the orbit to the antra. These lines are called line of sib line of sibilu. These are the things. This is the one line. This is the one line. Floor of the antra and floor of the orbit. This is the this is the sinus. This is the sinus. This is the sinus. See that this is maglary sinus. This is the one line is here. One line is above. And this is called line of sibilu. And this is a suprastructure, mesostructure, infrastructure. This is what is being classified. The corresponding areas are there. You can see that whatever area is there in that uh, region. Very corresponding. Accordingly, it presents actually. So diagnosis is X-ray of the part initially. X-ray of the part shows opacity with the nodes in the structure of the bony wall seen. And X-ray is waterous PNS view. Waterous PNS view is occipital mental like this. Waterous PNS. What view will look this? Waterous PNS view. This is very important. CT scan ideal method. Of course, reconstructive image you have to see because you have to see all around posterior skull base, everything, DM joint, all those things. Here you have to see. Sinus endoscopy for retinal exam, sinus and for biopsy. Now currently biopsy is done for sinus endoscopy. Olden days biopsy done through nasal or oral on early stage through Caldwell like operation. Lift the lip, make an incision here, then open the sinus and take the biopsy. This is for biopsy, not for surgery. Remember, surgery is now it is usually through the sinus endoscopy. Now this is the one is used for biopsy. In the olden days, they used to do through what is called as a Caldwell like operation, and it is a, for a benign condition. Caldwell like approach is very important. You can go through sinus and clear everything. But for malignancy, one for biopsy. For malignancy, not for surgery. Remember, surgery different approach. Now, T N M staging. I am not detailing it. Current eighth edition staging is there. See that. See the tumor coming out here. See the tumor going here. To the swelling here. See the bulge here. See this can every variety gone. See the opacity here. See that. In the PNS view, see the sign. This is the normal sign. This is the pathological. See that entire sign is involved. Orbital plate uh, is getting involved. Down it is coming out. Everything. See the extension here. Very typical. See it. If you do reconstructive image, it will show everything. All all area very clearly. So again, in the patient, you can see that. You see that here. Epiphora. It is a watering. Water. You can see that trickling water. You can see that means block or less than a small duct actually. I also orbital plate also getting in nodes coming out, and the nostril. See that nostril, it is bulge. There is bulging into the nostril here. So everything is uh, see that very clear. It is 
So, so we typically look at this patient, you will be able to diagnose if you have got some idea about some angular sinus anatomy and different aspects. So, treatment is uh, uh, surgery, total maxillatum and reconstruction. I already told it requires a team approach, uh, skull based surgeon sometimes, uh, entire ENT surgeon, total maxillatum. You need a dentist to, to get a mold and reconstruct uh, alveolus, all those things because you are doing total maxillatum. Weber Ferguson incision is used for the maxillectomy, not called to a look. This incision, see that, and reflect the flap and remove it. And the flap heals very well, actually, because very vascular flap. And the only thing is the reconstruction is very, very important. How to reconstruct this part is very important. Preoperative radiotherapy sometimes is very important, as the initial uh, shrinkage of the tumor. After that, six weeks total maxillectomy is done. Reconstruction of maxilla along with the dental reconstruction is required. So, that's what you have planned reconstruction, requires a team approach. For lymph nodes, of course, you have to do a radical necrotization or MR and also, depending on the grade, stage, everything, whatever it is. Postoperative therapy and chemotherapy is also should be considered. So, all modality of treatment is important. Surgery, initial uh, radiotherapy, may be called as new age radiotherapy, uh, surgery, reconstruction, postoperative radiotherapy, postoperative chemotherapy, then proper follow up. So, all these things are very, very important because alveolus are removed. Palate is exposed, palate is removed, so abdominal food is exposed there, nasal cavity is exposed, so you have to reconstruct it, proper reconstruct method. You need a dentist help also. Overall prognosis is only 30 to 40 percent, you got a very aggressive tumor, not a good prognosis because when they present, the local extension is so much that early tumor, then we got a good prognosis. By the time they come, like whatever photos you have seen, you definitely it's very difficult to um, treat. So that is what maxillary tumor, that is what uh, Paranel sinus, that is what uh, nasopharynx, that is what oropharynx. Just I have discussed. Uh, then I said uh, paranel sinus, everything I have discussed, maxillary, parental, everything. Mainly maxillary tumor, I said. I also discussed nasopharyngeal carcinoma also. So now I said lower part nasopharynx, oropharynx, alveopharynx. Above the whole are nasopharynx, between the whole and the epiglottis, that is uh, oropharynx, and below the epiglottis, laryngopharynx. Now, last part of it is I am discussing the larynx or laryo, laryngopharynx actually called as external examination you have to do from here. Position of the hormone thyroid cartilage, Adam's apple is noted. It may be shifted to the right or left, this part. And another thing you have to check is the laryngeal crepitus. Always do like this, move it, move the larynx, hold it like this, hold it like this, move it like this. Normally, you will feel a tuck, tuck, tuck sound. That is normally present. That is a normal. And it is uh, derived from the cricoarytenoid joint. And normally, one side, one cricoarytenoid and cricothyroid, other side, another uh, cricoarytenoid and cricothyroid. So, one pair of cricoarytenoid, one pair of cricothyroid. Four joints are there. Two on each side in larynx. How many joints for uh, larynx? Four joints. Two cricothyroid, cru two cricoarytenoid, one on each side. And uh, Laryngeal crepitus, which is normally present while moving, is derived from the cricoarytenoid joint. That's what you have to remember. Just to, that's what externally you inspect everything larynx. Now, this uh, laryngeal crepitus will be absent in laryngeal malignancy or when larynx is fixed, when in the pharyngeal growth may extend into that. That may, that time it will be absent. That is what eliciting the laryngeal crepitus is very very important clinically, which is normally present. I am repeating it is normally present. You don't get confused. It is derived. It is derived from the Cricoarytenoid joint, crepitus is from the cricoarytenoid joint. So, how many joints? Two cricoarytenoid, two cricoarytenoid, one on each side. Four, totally four joints are there for the larynx. Just for anatomy, because it's very important, sometimes they'll be asked in the exam, even thyroid or neck swelling, they will ask. Second is the neck, you have to check always because there is a silent laryngeal growth. Uh, and such a situation, uh, you have to consider that is the primary. So, internal examination. It is done under local anesthetic spray with the help of laryngoscope. Good elimination is necessary, which is provided by a headlamp or head mirror. So, indirect laryngoscopy is important. I already told posterior rhinoscopy is opposite of that. That is indirect laryngoscopy. So, how to do that? Examiner sits in front of the patient who sits upright with the head bent slightly forward. Patient open the mouth widely. It's very, very important. Uh, widely any artificial denture present is removed. This is again important because uh, it may cause problem while doing the technique. Local and anesthetic spray is used to anesthetize the posterior pharyngeal wall to suppress gag reflex. Otherwise, they like gag reflex when you put when you put mirror long lengthy handle is there. You got a mirror tip, there is a round mirror is there. 
when you put that you may touch the fairing then suddenly furniture is very sensitive then you have a gag replace and they will bite the mirror and all those things and they will not allow further examination so better to spray some and lysol can cause it so that another is that so reduces the gag replace patient is asked to protrude the tongue out which is gently pulled out with the gauze meanwhile with one finger upper lip should be raised lift raise the upper lip light is reflected to the pairings from head mirror so head mirror focus on the, this one laryngeal mirror is warmed up prior to the introducing into the mouth to prevent fogging of the mirror it's very important you have to warm you have to dip in the warm water warm saline and introducing into the mouth to prevent fogging of the mirror by breath otherwise fogging of course you won't be able to see anything it is passed into the posterior aspect of the mouth placed firmly but gently um, uh, on the soft palate just above the base of the ula by tilting the head mirror the light is directed on various part of the larynx and hypoparynx but the mirror is placed on soft palate should not be moved as the patient may gag or close the mouth um, should we should not very carefully static you have to keep it then uh, you have to tilt the mirror and see all those things not the mirror light is directed various parts of the larynx and hypoparynx but the mirror placed on soft palate should not be moved very important hold the mirror st- uh, static but you change your head mirror and foc- light or light focus so that you can see different parts of the uh, area larynx uh, area you can see vocal cord you can see uh, piriform fossa you can see aryopiglottic fold corniculate uh, arytenoid corniculate cuneiform cartilages everything tracheal rings from within you can see uh, that is normal when you ulceration growth the vocal cords Oh, then uh, vocal poly, vocal nodule, small vocal cord, vocal cord, or glottic uh, ulcers, glottic growth, everything can be visualized with this. Uh, of course, currently video laryngoscopes are available uh, to have a better identification also. So, reflected light from the head mirror is focused on the laryngeal mirror to visualize the posterior aspect of the mouth as, as follows in succession. Back of the tongue, vallecula, epiglottis, posterior parotenoid, aryopiglottic fold, vocal cord, firiform bosa, tracheal rings. everything i have told same thing it is uh, uh, written here now it is very very important uh, to do uh, next part is uh, patient is asked to utter e it's very very important e e like that and actually you have to tell the patient before doing only you have to inform the patient i will tell uh, tell e that when we have to tell e only not uh, other word otherwise they will think anything any word is okay because they are under mirror they can't move their tongue they will find difficult so you should do. initially train them you should then inform them uh, clearly that you have to tell only e not other word because e is the abductor uh, push abdu- uh, required that movement will be able to clearly uh, find out so movement movement will be very clearly seen abduction adduction of the movement is what you want to look for so e movement of the vocal cord observed for abduction and adduction of the movement on quiet, quiet inspiration they move out towards a small extent and on inspiration on expiration they move in again but do not reach the midline full abduction movement is seen in deep inspiration so during inspiration expiration also ask the patient same time you ask the patient to tell take deep inspiration your mirror is inside and expiration and mirror inspiration and expiration and check the what happens through the vocal cord position phonation bring the cord together in bilateral parallel of the cord they remain immobile in cadaveric position midway between the abduction and adduction in unilateral parallel the affected cord remains immobile in cadaveric position but may sometimes cross the midline if your vocal cord is like this it may be like this only or it may be like this one is not moving or it may be uh, it may be this is like this uh, this this because of that it will go this will move like this this is like this it's like this so opposite side moves to the other side this is the side so to compensation like this like this it moves so that is what it happens towards it crosses the midline and moves so that it compensate so in um, um, one side actually immobile one side position so that is how exactly you will do the you know, indirect laryngoscopy this question is in detail asked in uh, even surgical side even though it is a ent you have learnt and forgotten it's important here because especially in thyroid when you do it the present the thyroid case as a long case and uh, naturally they will ask before surgery you have to always examine the vocal cord it's essential legally and clinically also important and how to do that uh, you have to know so all these steps of indirect laryngoscopy you have to do what word you will say what are the abduction and adduction and all these things you have to remember this way i'm just telling this this point is very very important 
we will again discuss it while uh, while discussing in eventual few due course of time uh, while discussing thyroid we will again discuss this part because very very important clinical side they will ask when you present a thyroid thyroid is a long case for you then discussion on presents uh, what all things you will do i will do in depth laryngoscopy these steps should be known should be always expressed clearly without any problem without any mistake so that is the indirect laryngoscope is coming down so all this movement you check all these things you can be able to see vocal cord and uh, vestibule uh, uh, false vocal cord then uh, true vocal cord tracheal rings um, retinoid cuneiform corniculate see that i have already told retinoid cuneiform corniculate areopiglot fold piriform fossa will be there piriform fossa will be here epiglottis everything can be very nicely seen with this of course currently they do if anywhere wherever they will they do video video laryngoscope will do a laryngoscope direct laryngoscope also can do and identify these things but there's the preliminary clinical method of examining the uh, uh, larynx so we can't forget so this is a very important thing so ils is very important in the exam even now as a general surgeon epiglottis observed as a pinkish white margin orangs in interior interior of larynx any redness swelling ulcer edema excess secretion in this region are observed are epiglottic folds and retinoids should appear smooth symmetrical and more pink than epiglottis are are retinoid corniculate cuneiform already told i have shown the diagram in the previous slide smooth glistening ivory white colored vocal cord should be observed for any congestion ulceration papilloma growth or its edges I already told these things vocal nodule will be there continuous speakers continuous Uh, singers uh, no, continuously they do they they will get weak repeated vibration local nodule so you have to give a voice rest to such patient for many weeks to come back to the normal papilloma occurs in children carcinoma in elderly or the anterior half of the vocal cord so where where a carcinoma occurs vocal cord has got anterior half and posterior in the anterior half this is mcq question remember carcinoma occurs in the which part of the vocal cord commonly of course and common is different thing which is common site in the vocal cord is anterior part anterior half the anterior half of the vocal cord a point you have to always remember and direct laryngoscopy also shown the photo you know you have seen in direct laryngoscopy in always in ot while giving general anesthesia you have to use that you can always like, take ask them to just show me how to lay how what larynx is seen they'll definitely if you show interest they will show you and teach you how to do lar- direct laryngoscopy and also i will make you to see the larynx uh, different parts also so definitely you can do that in ot when you are got a operation theater posting if you observe you can take their help and do yourself and find out neck lone lymph node exam cervical lymph node uh, are examined for enlargement as in metastasis systemic exam respiratory system is examined for any evidence of tuberculosis and secondaries so that is also important neck lymph node exam system because of respiratory system and other areas you would examine naturally So this is the anatomy of larynx showing supraglottic, glottic, subglottic area. This is very important. Supraglottic, supraglottic, glottic, subglottic area. Supraglottic, glottic, subglottic. This is important because carcinoma can occur. Supraglottic main common, glottic, subglottic, subglottic area lymph node elements later could get better prognosis. So all these classifications important. This ano this picture is very important. Anatomy to have the idea about. Uh, How exactly laryngeal cancers are uh, classified? Actually, so what are the diseases of the larynx? Laryngeal edema is very common. Traumatic, infective, allergic, drug-induced, gas like uh, uh, burn area. You go there. All those toxic uh, uh, fumes cause laryngeal edema. There is also laryngeal edema, lung edema. Because they die of that chemicals, irradiation, angioneurotic, uh, cardiac, renal causes. Vocal nodule, continuous uh, singers and uh, speakers. I already told vocal polyps, vocal papilloma, laryngeal carcinoma. These are the reasons the larynx commonly you remember. And uh, laryngeal like laryngoscopy, video laryngoscopy, you definitely visualize everything. Neck examination, laryngeal crepitus. Very naturally, so keep this one in mind. Larynx, I will exactly let it anatomically uh, installed there. Then you will be able to pictureize and uh, do all this examination without any. Difficulty, so that is that the different diseases you have to remember. I have not detail anything other than laryngeal carcinoma, which is very important because the differential diagnosis for your neck swelling, neck secondary is one of the causes of laryngeal. If there is a neck swelling lymph node, if it is secondary, if you are suspecting clinically, the patient is having change in the voice, and if when you examine, sometimes there may be sometimes there may be absence of laryngeal crepitus, then your first diagnosis will be secondary to the neck with the primary in the larynx. 
because there is a change in the voice and also there is absence of laryngeal crepitus so that is you have to correlate there may be any visual occasion very rarely laryngeal growth present as a primary present as a swelling at the laryngeal level so mainly it is just inside so where there are very commonly there are secondaries in the neck level 2 and 3 so that is important to correlate so we have to correlate clinical features and present uh, signs so that come into a clinical diagnosis That's what i meant actually so laryngeal crepitus is important change in the voice is important laryngoscope is important to visualize the for the primary then of course the neck node naturally will be there in such a patient when they present many times especially supraglottic and glottic subglottic glottic uh, to have a neck lip node or enlargement is only very late because initially got a vocal cord and that got a much lymphatics so naturally lymph node spread becomes late so malignant tumors of the larynx etiology have just to go through it all of you know that for the same thing like oral cancers smoking tobacco alcohol and take occupational industrial exposure to chemicals like mustard gas asbestos benzopyrones petroleum products previous all those industrial commodities previous irradiation genetic russian develop familial laryngeal cancers is russian that is common as runs in family papilloma virus that is common causes laryngeal papilloma may turn into carcinoma keratosis malnutrition now incidence is commercial carcinoma is the commonest one remember so all these areas in that dead neck commercial carcinoma is the commonest thing look at the natural laryngeal laryngeal carcinoma look at the maxillary sinus malignancies common is the commercial carcinoma remember this is common in males then is one common in fifth and sixth decade it is so that it is very very common in males compared to females type is ulcerative proliferative so anatomical type supraglottic i had already shown the diagram there above the glottic level it arises from the infrahyoid part of this epiglottis ventricles and arytenoids it is fed to neck lymph nodes very early supraglottic because lymphatics very lot of lymphatics plenty of lymphatics are there in the supraglottic area due to rich lymphatics in this area already told throat pain dysphagia palpable neck nodes referred pain are common so we got a very typical presentation if there is a change in the voice with the dysphagia you have to think of supraglottic carcinoma or you have to think of a pharyngeal carcinoma extending to the larynx either way you have to think of so finally your management are more similar biopsy you have to take you have to assess uh, so both possible remember supraglottic and pharyngeal cancer neck lymph node commonly they present dysphagia and throat pain that is a very common presentation in this patient remember hoarseness of voice loss of weight respiratory obstruction because they will have difficulty in once there is a supraglottic breathing cannot they will have cider <gasps> Like that, cider is there, and it smells out because of necrotic tumor necrosis and kind of drift of fan. It smells out. There is halitosis, so the breathing difficulty or respiratory obstructive airway, then halitosis, uh, dysphagia, neck nodes. Clinical is very evident. We can diagnose clinically actually these conditions. You should use some sense, use some clinical application, examine patient carefully, have a clinical analysis. All these things you can diagnose. Nasal pharyngeal carcinoma is difficult to diagnose. Other things, it is quite a, very clearly evident to have a uh, evident and able to diagnose clinically if you apply uh, sensibly your clinical features and history. In Indian subcontinent, supraglottic tumors are more common than glottic. Glottic type is common in Western countries. Glottic has a better prognosis. Remember, fixation of the cords due to involvement of thyroarytenoid muscle or cricoarytenoid joint. I already told cricoarytenoid joint and thyroarytenoid muscle. both if you get infiltrated they will have a absence of laryngeal crepitus and fixation that is that means it is there is a fixation of the larynx so cricoarytenoid joint is involved or thyroarytenoid muscle is involved and uh, so fixation of the larynx occur and get fixed so you won't develop any crepitus which is normal while holding the larynx and move horizontally so it don't get the crepitus absence of laryngeal crepitus suggests fixation of the larynx fixation occurs once the joint the cricoarytenoid joint is involved or thyroid and muscle is infiltrated so glottic type is very common especially in western countries commonest type it begins from upper part of or free edge of the vocal cord mid or anterior mid or commonly mid or anterior not posterior anterior is a common type I already told mcq question often extending at 10 mm below and it extends down or not upward and it is a commonest type remember it's a good type actually it does it spreads very slow to the lymphatic and region, local area So before that, because they present with the hoarseness of voice very early, so early stage only you diagnose and plan your treatment 
and uh, you will get a very good prognosis in this type. Lymphatics but is slow, only 4% as this area has got least lymphatics, I already told. Unlike supraglottic lymph node is very common. Presentation is, it is aggressive, actually aggressive because it takes time to, it, it, it uh, takes to difficult, it, uh, time to identify the growth there is proglottic. By then it spreads everywhere. And lymphatics but is common in there. there. Opposite of called can in all as a kiss cancer. Same thing, tonsil opposite side, kiss lesion that is benign one. It's a kiss cancer can occur. Vocal cord, upper lip, lower lip can, and, oh, is, again is a kiss cancer, upper lip, lower lip. Vocal cord also kiss cancer. Very, very, very closely related both sides, then malignancy can occur both sides. That is called kiss cancer. In few other places also it occurs. Lip, uh, tonsil, maybe, mainly benign condition, and uh, vocal cords. Vocal cord mobility is unaffected in early cases because it is only in the mucosal initially. So it won't go to a deeper plane. So mobility, vocal cord will not be affected. Only they present in the hoarseness of voice. And if you do ILS or video, video laryngoscope, then you will be able to see, take a biopsy, confirm. We can do a therapeutic endoscopic, therapeutic uh, treatment, therapy also for those patients uh, without doing a major uh, surgical intervention, of course. You may have to add on to the uh, chemotherapy to prevent recurrence. Vocal cord fixation signifies spread to thyroid, which is poor prognostic sign. I already told. If there is a thyroid joint and thyroid muscle, muscle is involved, then it carries poor prognosis, vocal cord gets fixed and cord fixation carries poor prognosis which is clinically identified by a absence of laryngeal crepitus. And it is of course eventually confirmed by doing imaging, proper imaging, maybe dynamic CT or MRI. So it present very early due to hoarseness of voice, already told, eventual cord fixation causes rider. So that is also important. Locally it spreads anteriorly to anterior commissure, posterior to vocal process and arytenoids, above to ventricle and false vocal cords, below to the subglottis. All this anatomy, whatever I have shown picture, that if you remember, everything around the area, it spreads, that's what it meant. Subglottic is rare actually. Remember, glottic is the commonest type. Next is supraglottic, then subglottic. Supraglottic is common in Indian subcontinent. Subglottic is uh, more common in Western countries. Subglottic is rare. It is less common in the undersurface the true vocal cords and subglottic space. It spreads through deep cervical and paratracheal nodes. Paratracheal nodes also can get involved in this type. Upward spread is rather late and so is not an early symptom in this type. So because vocal cord is not involved, so below that um, and upward spread occurs later only. So it present initially, uh, it won't present at all. So by the time it present, it is further rather late. So, difficult to manage such situation. Vocal glottic type present very early because hoarseness is very common, main presentation. So, pick up early before it spreads and you will have a cure rate high. It can spread through cricothyroid membrane or thyroid gland. It can come out through the cricothyroid membrane, the subglottic type. So, this little different presentation unlike uh, supraglottic and glottic. Remember, glottic and supraglottic is more common than the subglottic. So, only, only 2 percent common compared to that, 60-65 percent is glottic. 40 percent is 35 to 40 percent is supraglottic. That is a more common type. Whereas this is not common type. Remember, just a diagram. See that uh, supraglottic is here, glottic is here, around 10 uh, 10 millimeter. This is what I meant. And uh, subglottic is here. This is around 2 percent only. This is 60, 60 to 65 percent. This is to 40, 35 to 40 percent. 40 percent. This is this is the supraglottic is above. Glottic is here, subglottic is below. So this is just a diagrammatic representation of how it looks. Just, just, just referring to big, a big tumor here. These things will, these, this and this will form a very big tumor. But just wanted to show in how it is named above the glottis, on the glottis, below the glottis. It's on the glottis, it's above the glottis. Uh, that is how it differs from remember. Glottic type is the commonest term. Next is supraglottic. I already mentioned that here. 35, 40, 35, 2 percent. What is a rare? Only 1 to 2 percent here. So, remember this diagram again to correlate. I told all, I very clearly told about the anatomical correlation, uh, fixation, meaning of the cord fixation, which type is common, why hoarseness is present in the glottic type. So imagine this anatomy, you will be able to always correlate. You don't require any, you don't require to mug it up. It is an application, very clear application. Uh, and if you know how to apply these things, anatomy to the pathology, you are through with your clinical diagnosis and you need some sensible approach. That is the only thing. So clinical features are hoarseness of voice, pain, discomfort, cough, dyspnea, shider. I have shown how shider they present. 
dysphagia, bloody sputum, because it necrosis of course sputum comes there, palpable neck node eventually get fixed, absence of laryngeal crepitus, I already told how it is common in males. Everything I have discussed, why crepitus, everything I have clearly discussed without any confusion, remember. In the laryngoscopy, it's the initial way of evaluation, the clinical method actually. I have shown how exactly to do also very clearly. It is often asked in the viva, in clinical um, uh, method. So, you have to know how to do that. You can't avoid, you can't say I don't know. It's done everywhere, every hospital it's there, every ward it is there. Direct laryngoscopy and biopsy. Video, video laryngoscopies are currently available. That is also useful definitely. CT neck chest, maybe MRI to assess the soft tissues. Chest X-ray to see bronchopneumonia or anything, which is quite common. Of course, see the chest you do that is the most relevant. Chest X-ray is rest level. Once you do that, everything is visualized. FNAC of the lymph node to confirm second is micro laryngoscopy in small lesion to identify to have proper biopsy. It's very small lesion, could be a micro laryngoscopy. Toledum blue staining to stain early sup superficial cancers, which facilitate the accurate biopsy. You can stain with the toledum blue so that it staining makes a very exaggerated when small lesions. Flexible fibrotic laryngoscopy, definitely very, very useful current method to take biopsy to identify all areas, uh, periform fossa, area epiglottic fossa, arytenoid corniculate cuneiform, cartilages, everything can visualize currently with the fiber, flexible fibrotic stone. So, CT imaging, flexible fibrotic biopsy and bio, um, bi laryngoscopy and biopsy, the, the, these are the two, three things are very, very important evaluation method for laryngeal cancer. Of course, MRI or CT. Image is very important to see the soft tissue involvement, extent, everything, fixity, nodal status, everything. That is essential anyway. So, treatment is supraglottic stage 1 curative radiotherapy, stage 2 and 3 total laryngectomy with the blockization of the neck nodes, entire larynx is removed. Of course, then permanent recostomy is required. That is the only drawback. They cannot have a voice, they can solo definitely because the pharynx is there. They cannot have a voice. And they got a permanent recostomy. Of course, there are so many wise reconstruction methods are available. They are not available in many centers, but in spite of that, normal wise won't be there. They'll have a permanent recostomy in the neck. They will breathe through that. And they'll be, they have to be always permanently careful. Water can't go there and uh, sleeping, we have to be careful. They got taking bath. Day to day affair is uh, difficult. Washing mouth is important. Washing mouth, it can't trickle into the, this one. They will aspirate the water. Air should not go in this area. All the things are, uh, even though technically you do and finish and uh, not that easy to manage in the day to day affairs, they should be pretty careful. So, the precautions are important after surgery. Glottic radiotherapy is a choice as nodes are commonly not involved. Endoscopic laser surgery or open partial laryngectomy can be done, remember. So, in the laser surgery is quite effective in the glottic type because I said lymphatics are not involved, they are early stage, carries a better prognosis because local spread also late. So, you pick up such patients, they we tend to pick up early because they present with the hoarseness of voice. Subglottic total laryngectomy is a treatment of choice with nodal block when needed. In advanced stage 4 carcinoma uh, surgery, carcinomas, surgery and radiotherapy both are not possible. Here, chemotherapy is given using cycle phosphamide, cisplatin, and methyl exit. Now, why surgery is because it is fixed everywhere. Why radiotherapy is not possible? Because necrosis occurs. Uh, radiation edema occurs, so then breathing will be difficult. Uh, you may have to do a tracheostomy, that is also meant sometimes uh, it is difficult. So, we will not give in advanced stage, there is no point in doing. Give a chemotherapy, it carries anyway poor prognosis. That, uh, only lifespan in a few weeks they will die. So, that is uh, this one. So, this is the common type, good type. The next common type, again technically you have to do a aggressive surgery, aggressive radiotherapy. This is the uh, again rare type but often they present very late then prognosis is definitely less but it's a rare actually rare type it's luckily it is a rare type remember it is the commonest type the second common type so all these things are important uh, while managing not that easy to manage so they do total laryngectomy then uh, uh, permanent trichostomy speech therapy reconstruction for the speech the neck decision you have to do that is there anywhere to do neck decision sometimes both sides depending on the location of the tumor so, this is the tracheostomy. Look at the tracheostomy. So, the care is very important. This is the incision you will use. Gluck, Sorensen, laryngectomy incision. Maybe ask us an MCQ question like this. This is for block decision downward. So, that entire larynx is removed. And you remove thyroid also when you do that because it is hugging there and uh, won't be able to retain thyroid in such a patient when you do total laryngectomy. 
and naturally you have to supplement the patient with L thyroxine when you do that. This is the, this is the laryngectomy incision. Gluck Sorensen laryngectomy incision. We have to do a block decision also, remember. Now, conservative laryngectomy has becoming popular, especially in early growth, well differentiated growth, less aggressive growth. Here, early growth, mainly glottic type. If you are not laser, the laser endoscopic laser therapy is not possible, then you have to do a partial laryngectomy or uh, conservative laryngectomy. They are called as chordectomy, partial frontal and uh, lateral laryngectomy, partial horizontal laryngectomy. Although technical terminology, I am not going to detail it because basically the ENT procedure, ENT surgeons or skull based surgeons, uh, they do this procedure, mainly ENT surgeons. Advantage of permanent recostomy is avoided here, voice is retained. This is the advantage of that. But only main but real problem is inadequate tumor clearance and recurrence. Once you are not sure about the well, anywhere uh, in onco oncological um, uh, conditions, when it is early stage, when you say it is operable, oncological clearance is the most important thing you look into that. When, it, when surgery is the main treatment in any malignancy, suppose if it is radiotherapy and other things, that is different thing. Lymphoma, radiotherapy, that is basically it's oncological condition. But otherwise, surgically amenable conditions, oncological conditions, uh, where oncosurgery is the main priority treatment, and when it is operable uh, stage, your, your view is always oncological clearance. You cannot violate the oncological clearance principle. Now, if you violate that, it is possible when you do a conservative laryngectomy, then clearance is inadequate. Suppose, then recurrence will come here. Recurrent malignancy is the most dangerous thing. Can't do anything. And another laryngectomy, total laryngectomy, go ahead and do that also. Won't give a clear idea because recurrent tumor is aggressive, spreads. By the time they come to you, they think that everything is okay. By the time they come to you, it spreads everywhere. Your that becomes untouchable malignancy by surgery. Then whatever, once it is so, whatever you do, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, everything will become an eventual futile exercise. That's what is well done. Otherwise, it is a good thing, but always when they do, naturally, oncosurgeons, ENT surgeons come in, they come in, it is teamwork. They naturally always take care of the oncological clearance. That priority is there, definitely. They will do that. That is, But if it is possible, only they will intervene and do this one. Otherwise, they will go ahead with the total laryngectomy. Role of radiotherapy is very important. Early growth with no impairment, motility, curative radiotherapy is very useful with 90% cure rate with the preservation of the voice. So, advantage is you preserve the voice. The laryngeal is retained. Structure is retained. It is very, very important. It is commonly used in superficial exophytic lesion, growth in the tip of the epiglottic and epiglottic folds. In subglottic extension, fixed growth and in presence of nodes, radiotherapy is less effective. So, fixed growth, you have to do a total laryngectomy. Remember, you can't give away this uh, radiotherapy. So, care after your total laryngectomy is speech therapy by pseudoglottic glottis creation, battery operated artificial larynx or singer bloom prosthesis or pange prosthesis. All these prosthesis are there. Basically, they have got a different structure. That's an incarceration procedure. They do that. I'm not going to detail that. Tracheoesophageal prosthesis is ideal. TOP uh, uh, is ideal. So, how to do all those things? Not at your life, not necessary for people. All those things are very special uh, management uh, setup it is. Just remember, there is a surgical approach for maintaining, get the speech therapy back to certain extent, acceptable level, cosmetically, or socially acceptable level by all these methods. And rehabilitation is important in this patient. Care of permanent tracheostomy by avoiding immersion in the water is most of the thing. Care during bath, shower use. So suddenly you open the shower and it trickles here, they will aspirate. Swimming, they cannot go for swimming. They cannot, when in rainy season, they should be very careful. So day to day, why so many times you will come across the water in this area? You should be very careful. Shower covers, all covers are available for this purpose now. Special covers are available. Shower covers, they can breathe, but water won't get in. So specific shower covers are available nowadays when patient is having permanent recostomy. That may be used, that may really take care of these, all these real uh, day to day fire problems. Often, along with the total laryngectomy, total thyroidectomy and removal of parathyroid glands are required. And patient does such a need supplement some thyroxine, calcium, vitamin D. Because he tend, you have to remove the parathyroid also very close. We can't dissect and retain it in such situation many times. Uh, and you tend to do total parathyroidectomy also along with that, of course. They are not diseased. And total thyroidectomy also, it, uh, it is associated with that. Then you have to supplement thyroxine, maintain dose 100 microgram before food daily, permanently. And of course, calcium and vitamin D 
also you have to supplement these patients because once you have removed parathyroidectomy, they will have a permanent hypoparathyroidism. That also you have to take care of. Take water, day to day water showering, all those water problems are important. Social therapy and job therapy is important. All these cares are very, very important once you do the total uh, laryngectomy. Uh, so, students, we have discussed about the uh, jaw, we have discussed about the nasopharynx, oropharynx, we have discussed about the laryngopharynx, we have discussed about the nasopharyngeal carcinoma, very aggressive, we have discussed about maxillary tumors. And we have discussed about the laryngeal tumor where glottic time is the most common thing. Different approaches briefly I have discussed. Laryngeal capitis, clinical methods I have discussed very clearly. Uh, so students, I hope you have understood the session very well. Thank you very much.